is very, very important for determining uh, contributing factors to allergies, including allergies that can affect the brain. Um, avoiding chemical additives such as sulfur dioxide, MSG, colorings like red dye number 40, certain types of artificial sweeteners, you need to avoid them like the plague. Not acceptable, can't be utilized. Uh, you need to shop the perimeter of the grocery store. Avoid the chemical and the processed foods. Keep a food diary. Uh, eating organic. And in a food diary, I mean, especially if you have an autistic child, you keep track of what they've eaten and then what their behavior was following that particular food. I think you can do that with any kid, an ADD or an ADHD kid, and you can determine um, with a pretty precise whether or not that food agrees with them or not. So keeping a food diary. Carb-reduced diets, as we had uh, discussed with the Journal of Pediatrics, Massachusetts General Hospital finally found also as well, again, they supported books, diets, anything that you can get that have low yeast, low sugar diets. Very supportive, good research from two uh, good, one peer-reviewed uh, review journal and one uh, major uh, university or hospital. Um, when we look at the supplementation that's available, and I've only got about three or four minutes to go over this, but um, B6 and calcium citrate in combination with magnesium, 50% of the uh, autism reduced symptoms of autism. 50% of the participants saw an improvement. Um, a good multiple, high in Bs. Um, there is a... Uh, oh, REI is a, a biomedical uh, research company, and what they've done, they have over a thousand children who were moderately, mildly to moderately autistic, who are fully recovered. So, using this type of supplementation in their in their uh, programs, dimethylglycine improves speech and behavior. It's an oxygen carrier to the brain. Digestive enzymes. Remember how we mentioned how proteins and certain sugars autistic kids can't uh, break down or digest? Well, these enzymes can be added into the diet to help them digest those types of foods, even though obviously sticking with a lower carb diet seems to be what the hospitals and peer reviewed journals recommend. Probiotics, the good bacteria is a four billion plus viable strains. You'd have to eat 4,000 yogurts to be equivalent to one of those pills. So I, I don't want to hear yogurts as the option. And plus yogurt's a milk product. In autistic kids, you got to really think that that maybe is not a good thing to be ingesting unless you know for sure they're not allergic to milk. Buffered C for the immune system. Omega-369, Dr. Ayuda uh, found a lot of these kids have a severe constipation, once again, bowel issues, just adding in some good essential fatty acids. A fish oil, particularly a good clean fish oil, should taste not bad, um, should be pretty decent. One to three teaspoons a day really help with bowel movement uh, and elimination. MSM, something we use typically in arthritis, Calmness and concentration, alertness, all those things came out with these autistic kids. Choline, phosphatidylserine, key fatty acids. RNA, DNA, I've got it sitting there in my shelf and I kind of always wondered, you know, I know why people use this, but now I know why they really use it. Um, it builds br new brain tissue. <coughs> pretty awesome, pretty neat, eye, whether you got autism or whatever. It's been shown to build new brain tissue available. D3, um, Ralph talks a lot about D3, but for these kids apparently, they don't have uh, a good absorption of D3, the fat soluble vitamin, D3. Paramount to increase in their diet. Um, supplementation wise, you're never gonna get this in food. CoQ10, melatonin. I have several of my customers that use melatonin on their autistic kids. Helps them sleep, helps them sleep. Fiber, 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 keep the bowel moving. Vary from food, from flax, whatever you can get a hold of. There are so many more, so many other uh, supplements that you can research online, talk to specialists about. These are the ones that I came across. Once again, research it further. I think to some extent autism can be prevented but it is seeming to be a peer, uh, part of our society with all of the genetics, chemicals, vaccines, all of it combined together. That's our society. We're gonna be moving on to the next portion of our show, which is the fitness portion. Thank you. Welcome to 
the fitness portion of our show and at the end of our last segment I forgot to hold up a couple of books Autism for Dummies, an excellent book. I think you should take a peek at if you've got an autistic child or you want to read more. Lots of good information. There are cookbooks out there for ADHD, ADD, autism. They're available. Use them. Our, for our fitness portion of our show, I want to talk about a, I don't know if you call it an ailment, but a lot of women that are perimenopausal, actually from 20 and above I'm seeing, where they just can't lose weight, they're not eating very much, and they can't figure it out, and their diets are clean, and they're like, what's going on here? And what I have them do is I have them take a body temperature test for three mornings in a row. Get up, go pee, put the thermometer in your mouth. And if your body temp is re running between 97 and 98.2, it could mean that you have a borderline underactive thyroid that won't show up in a standard TSH test. Those tests are only about 25% accurate. So what I suggest you do three mornings in a row, if it comes out 97.5, or excuse me, 97.5, uh, uh, 97.7, you know, with that in that range, you probably have a borderline underactive thyroid. There are good health food stores that have thyroid glandulars, things that you can research to stimulate uh, thyroid, uh, especially T3 output. If your temperature runs in the 96s, go back to your doctor and ask for a full thyroid panel that includes T3, T4, and TSH. Next, we'll be moving on to the research portion of our show. Thank you. Welcome to the research portion of our show, and with us today again is Ralph Turciano. And thank you for the intro. Well, another weapon on the fight on obesity. An interesting amino acid they discovered, and this was done by uh, Texas AgriLife researchers, they discovered that arginine, a fairly common amino acid, when by itself, greatly reduced the amount of body fat gained in mice and animals. Now, it's not a loss, but here's the key. The objective was to make these animals fat. They found out when arginine was supplemented in their diets, it reduced the amount of fat that was gained by 65%. After that, they decided to go into research a little further. What they discovered was this, that arginine redirected the energy that would normally go to producing more fat into creating lean muscle mass. An incredibly neat component. So basically now, as time goes on, I guarantee you'll find arginine make an upswing as far as something that's popular again. One word of warning I did not mention in the article is some people with cold sores it can bring out, just to keep in mind. Also too, for those athletes out there, arginine was shown, shown to lower branch chain amino acid levels in the blood. So when doing arginine, let's say for cutting up or leaning out, Basically, make sure you add a little bit of leucine, isoleucine, and valine. Those are your BCAAs. After that, researchers at the University of Gothenburg discovered that natural perfumes also can create allergies. Now, what happens is, even though what's occurred, these natural perfumes in their essential oil form are fine, and they do protect themselves from auto-oxidation, but when adding rose oil or something like that to the skin would form a certain compounds which would create like for example, geraniol, that are very similar to common allergens. It's just something to keep in mind. And also too, just to keep in mind that perfumes and colognes can create allergies, even the non-natural ones. And that's really a note out to you guys out there wearing those paint thinner based uh, colognes in the gym. Yeah, really just kind of lower the volume on that a little bit. And then gut bacteria. Well, some of those interesting discovered. This goes against obesity again. Gut bacteria, they found out, produced a very important essential fact called CLA. There are many different types of CLAs. Some CLAs are actually not good, but conjugated linoleic acid. So what they discovered is that people were eating foods that were higher, ironically, in natural, or I should say close to organic dairy forms of milk and cheese, produced higher levels of CLA, which in turn increased the metabolism, but also was very protective against colon, and IB, colon cancers, and irritable bowel syndrome, inflammatory bowel disorders, and so on and so forth. Real important. Now think of the inverse part. If that good bacteria in your gut is responsible for producing CLA, what kills that good bacteria? Antibiotics. 
That may be a strong key on how antibiotics cause people to gain body fat by killing off the body's natural ability to basically fight fat. Another one, exercise. Now, this is not for obesity, but for vision loss. The U.S. Department of Energy, basically Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory, discovered, or they looked at 31,000 runners, that those that ran had less cataracts. In fact, out of their group of 31,000, they looked at the women, they couldn't find cataracts at all. But overall, they found this. Men who ran more than 5.7 miles per day had a 35% lower risk than developing cataracts than those who ran 1.4 miles per day. The fittest men had half the chance of developing cataracts. And they found that the people who ran at least more than 2.4 miles per day had between a 42 and 54% lower risk of the disease. Definitely correlation, or should I say cause and effect, between the running and reduction in cataracts. Canker sores, B12, they discovered it was incredible. This is at Ben Gurion University. They discovered that those people who took B12 for six months had, that were prone to canker sores had a 74% reduction in canker sores, period, as opposed to a placebo group which only had a 32%. They also said, however, the duration of outbreaks, the number of ulcers, the level of pain were reduced significantly at five to six months of treatment with vitamin B12, regardless of the B12 starting in the blood to begin with. How much B12 you say? 1,000 micrograms, small amount, under the tongue, right before going to bed, nothing special. Real easy fix. Formaldehyde. Now to that. You got formaldehyde in your house, brand new carpet, plastics, new car, whatever it is. I don't know how you do this, but they found out fresh plants reduced formaldehyde levels by 80% in that house within just four hours. Real important if you got anything new and you got that venting of new building syndrome, or sometimes called sick building syndrome, just get some live plants. Be a big difference. With no plants at all, it only went down 7.9% in four hours. Vaccinate or not to vaccinate? Well, they discovered that basically herpes simplex virus protects you from a lot of deadly bacterial diseases. So the question right now that doctors are asking is whether vaccination should be a good protocol or not. Something to think about the long term. You get vaccinated against it, you don't get the disease, you find yourself a give and take, you're prone to much worse uh, bacterial conditions than you maybe actually realize. Something to really weigh the balance on. I rush you that because of this. This article, which is outside the mainstream media, U.S. researchers find traces of toxic mercury in high fructose corn syrup. Not in your TV news, and I don't know why. They found out, since a lot of manufacturers still use plants across the United States to make soda and acid by mixing briny solutions and electrified bats and mercury here in the United States, that the mercury actually leaks into the system. Out of the 20 samples they looked at, nine were contaminated with mercury. The average American consumes 12 teaspoons of corn syrup per day. If you're a kid, it's a lot less. Even at established low dose of 5.5 micrograms per day, the average person would consume five times the safe level of mercury according to the EPA that's out there. Why it's not in the news, I don't know, but please research that yourself. It's very important. Thank, thank you very, very much, much. Ralph. I appreciate it. Thank you. Once again, autism, food poisoning, <laughs> or chemical poisoning, please do your homework, do your research, find out things for yourself. Thank you very much for joining us. Bye.